All right, levels, 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 levels. Well, all the attention lately has been focused on the new M1 Pro and M1 Max 14 and 16 inch computers. I'd like to talk about the 2020 13 inch M1 MacBook Pro and why I think it's worth your money over the 13 inch MacBook Air. Since its release, the Air was always the thin and light MacBook that looked really, really sexy while you're using it, but always lacked real power inside to be your only computer. This changed in late 2020 when the M1 SoC was released, transforming the two 13-inch MacBooks from adequate notebooks into miniature powerhouses, with performance rivaling some of the best computers on the market, and even besting some, including Apple's own industrial Mac Pro. But this M1 chip presented a strange problem not before seen. The Air was transformed into a real contender for a daily-use laptop, and possibly your only laptop. Now, there isn't much more that I can say that hasn't already been said in the years since these machines were released, but unlike what nearly every other YouTube review would have you believe, not everyone is a video editor. The vast market of people would be perfectly suited with the M1 standard chip. But there's an issue with virtually every single review that asks the question, do I get the Pro or the Air 13-inch model? I've looked at dozens and dozens of reviews from across the internet, and they all seem to reach the same conclusion, that the Air is the one to get out of the two. But I think they get to that conclusion for only one reason, and that's cost. And if cost is your only concern, I can totally understand why the Air would be the one you would focus on. It does have a starting price for under $1,000, but just barely. And once you configure it to an actual useful configuration of storage and RAM, you're well beyond that $1,000 price. In my opinion, I think the default MacBook, the most bang for your buck configuration, is the 16 gigabytes of RAM with a one terabyte SSD. And that goes for either the Air or the Pro model. The Pro at that spec costs $1,899, and the Air, identically configured, is only $300 less. So the question is, why would I recommend spending that extra $300? I like to keep my computers for as long as possible in order to get what I feel is the best return on my investment. I finally retired my 2015 in 2018 when I got the new 13-inch MacBook Pro that had just come out with the quad-core CPU. I got the i5, 16 gig RAM, and one terabyte of storage. This one was supposed to be better as it had the improved butterfly keyboard that wasn't supposed to break, but still had the things that people either love or hate, like the touch bar and USB-C only. For me, I hope this machine would give me the size and weight I preferred for work and travel while retaining the power of the 15-inch. Everything was going great until I realized that a quad-core CPU inside such a small, thin, and light chassis was probably not the best idea. My computer took on the second job of smelting iron ore as this thing would get so hot under some tasks that it became almost impossible to use. So when the M1 was announced, I knew I had to get one, but I was caught in my own trap. I had spent so much money on the 13-inch laptop just two years prior that I couldn't see replacing it so soon. Plus, I had invested in a 12.9 iPad Pro with keyboard to use as my daily driver as much as possible, reverting only to the MacBook when truly necessary because of the heat and fan noise. But... Over time, I started to break down. I ended up having to get the keyboard replaced with Apple's extended warranty and finally decided that I was done with the keyboard, the heat, and the noise and knew that I had to get the M1 version. So while the 14 and 16 inch models had just come out and the M1 was now a year old, I was originally hesitant about buying what was considered a year old design and a year old computer. However, Macs don't really age the same way as other PCs do. And when it came down to it, I felt that it still provided the best performance and cost for me. And plus, I just really like the 13-inch form factor. I'm not a video editor. I'm not using Final Adobe ProRes, Buzz, Lightroom, Pixelmator programs. So the power of the M1 Pro and Max would probably be wasted on me. The ports don't really bother me as I have a really good adapter that I can use. It has everything that I need. The stuff I use it for is what I consider to be normal stuff. I use stuff on the internet. I use web browsers. I do email. I play some games. I listen to some music. I convert video files now and again. Maybe crop a photo. Maybe make something in iMovie. The main thing though, this has to be done on a computer that I'm going to use for years as my primary machine and possibly in many cases my only machine. I know that while I really like what the 14 inch has and what it offers, and I really prefer the 13 inch form factor for its overall size and weight when compared to the 14. What's funny about that is that the 2021 14 inch is about the same size and weight as the old 13 inch, the 2015 and earlier models. Nobody ever felt that those things were too big and heavy to use at that time. I mean, neither did I when I was carrying one around. But now that I've been using this 13 inch for so long, I really don't want to go back to it. So getting back to the Air versus Pro debate, just like everyone else, I was utterly confused. And I ended up ordering an Air and a Pro and tested them side by side for a few days. But here are my reasons for spending the extra $300 
on the pro over the air and why I think it might be better for you as well. Number one, brighter screen. Not by a lot, but by enough. Both screens are excellent, better than my Intel version, and those extra nits are nice to have and may come in handy one day should you need them. Again, you gotta look at this computer as you're keeping it for a while and you can't upgrade it after you buy it. Number two, longer battery life. If battery life is important to you, the Pro will last a bit longer. Not tremendously longer, but maybe just long enough to make a difference in finishing some work. Number three, the touch bar. Yes, I said it, the touch bar. If you really are someone that doesn't like this feature, then you're in luck because no other computer has it and you have tons of options. However, I feel that the touch bar has been unfairly criticized for most of its life. I also think that almost all of its criticism is coming from a very vocal set of people who dislike it, and the ones who like it aren't saying anything. But I think if you give it a chance and learn how to use it, you can find that it has much more utility than most people give it credit for. I see it very much like the iPhone touchscreen and why Steve Jobs chose to get rid of the phone's physical keyboards, which also seemed crazy at the time. Unfortunately, though, I think the touch bar is on life support, and at this time, the 13-inch MacBook Pro might be the last laptop with it, and so I wanted to get the latest and newest computer with the touch bar so that hopefully it lasts as long as possible, just in case Apple does decide to retire it. There are some really cool things you can do with it to fix some of the issues that people have with it. For example, I have mine configured, so if I press the function key, the quote-unquote regular Mac keys show up for screen brightness, keyboard brightness, volume, and so forth. On the Air with the latest Monterey OS, if you want to adjust something like the MacBook keyboard brightness, you got to go to Control Center and use the software keys as they've taken those physical keys away from you. This is a, a minor issue. How often you adjust your keyboard brightness is probably hardly worth mentioning, but it's there. Also, for things like the volume, you can just press, hold, and slide. You don't have to go through the two-step process. I like things like the visual feedback I get for things like Touch ID that lets me know what the computer is waiting on or how much time is left in the video. I also like the autocomplete, like on the iPhone, for when I'm filling out web forms or trying to correct a spelling error. I realize that everyone doesn't like it, and I respect that. At the very least, I would wish that Apple would keep it as a build-to-order option, but even I seriously doubt that that's going to happen. Number four, the fan. Apple calls it an active cooling solution, but it's a fan. If you're looking for the maximum performance for the longest period of time and the longest lifetime of your Mac itself, then a fan is a must in my opinion. I have a real-world use case, as again, I'm not a video editor. For example, Universe Sandbox. This is another program that can make the Intel MacBook fans go crazy. I ran the same simulation side by side on the M1 Pro and the M1 Air to see what would happen, plus the Intel. My example was simple. I put a massive black hole in the center of the galaxy and it really taxed the system. The Intel Pro ran it, began to drop frames, and the fans ramped up to full speed. Both the M1 Air and the Pro performed well but the Pro's fans did turn on after a few minutes and the body did become warm underneath. On the air, it was a little bit different. The palm rests grew very warm and the underside became what can only be described as hot. However, it did still run the simulation. Both the Pro and the Air performed identically up until the heat became an issue, and then the CPU must thermally throttle down. My final thoughts are this. The M1 Air is, to me, kind of the equivalent of having an iPad Pro but running Mac OS. It's passively cooled, has, still has great performance, and is more than you need for your basic, normal, everyday needs. And to be honest, I still want one, but I couldn't keep both, and cho so I chose the Pro. For me, the additional cost is worth it because I knew I'd be keeping this computer for many years, and the cost would be negligible, in fact over that time, and I didn't want any chance of buyer's remorse. Naturally, I got the 16 gigs of RAM with the one terabyte internal storage. The battery life, the brighter screen, the fan, and the touch bar were my deciding factors. While I love the Air's wedge shape, which is very nice for typing, I don't feel that the consistent thickness of the Pro makes typing uncomfortable in actual use. It's also a funny note that the Air is thinner in the front of the, from the Pro, but is actually thicker in the back. Some other little side notes, the M1 Pro is ever so slightly thicker than the Intel version to accommodate the new keyboard. You'll never notice it with your eye, but I saw it when I tried to reuse a clear case that I had for my Intel version, and it just wouldn't fit. The USB-C ports, both the Air and the Pro only have two on the left side. My Intel version had four, two on each side, and I'll admit, I missed that. It was very convenient being able to power the machine from either side. So that's my opinion on this whole thing. So what do you think? Also, if you're curious about the skin that I have on my computers, please check out Easy Skins. I'll put a link down below. They're not a sponsor, but I love their products. I've been using them for years. They're really high quality. They're easy to install. They last a long time. They're truly a premium product. They're based out of the UK. They ship worldwide and very often have sales and coupons that you can get if you sign up for their marketing emails. Again, not a sponsor, but I highly recommend that you check them out if you haven't already. Anyway, thanks for watching. See you next time. couple other interesting differences between the M1 and the 
Intel. On the battery page in System Preferences, uh, if you well, let's start with the Intel. You can see that there is the uh, power nap optimizations, low power mode, all these little options that you have that you can play with. But if you go over to the M1 version, you can see that a lot of them are missing.